Delayed sequence intubation. Are you using it? What's the evidence? That's this episode of First 10 EM. So, DSI, I mean, it comes straight from the mouth of Scott Weingarten, so you'd probably have to be living under a rock not to have heard about it by now. But just to make sure we're all on the same page, DSI is essentially procedural sedation for the procedure of pre-oxygenation. It was designed for agitated patients who are not allowing you to pre-oxygenate them. Patients who are pulling off their oxygen mask, they're panicking because their SATs are 60 or 70%. So what you do is you give them small doses of ketamine until they calm down and then you pre-oxygenate them. And that can be however you want. You can use a non-breather, a BVM, BiPAP, whatever you think is needed. And then you only proceed when you're comfortable. When the O2 sats come up, that's when you proceed with paralysis and intubation. And this has become wildly popular, probably because it started on MCRIT, but also because you really only have to try this technique one time to realize how effective it is. You take these patients who before were wildly agitated, you could never get their SATs up. And so at least when I trained, what you did was you just tried to tube them as fast as possible and their SATs were plummeting behind you. And now all of a sudden you have this chill patient and you can take your time, you can position them, you can prep your equipment, you can proceed only when you get that nice reassuring oxygen saturation of 100%. Now I'm a huge EBM guy. We're not supposed to talk about anecdotes, but man, do I have dozens of anecdotes where this completely changed a resuscitation. But evidence-based medicine, so let's jump in. Last year, the first ever RCT of delayed sequence intubation was published. I'll see if I can pronounce this uh, correctly. It's Bandiopadi et al, 2023. Sorry if I got that wrong. Now let's just say from the outset, this is not a perfect trial. It's small, it's single center, it's unblinded. But it is our first study of a technique that lots of people are already using. So I think this is an important trial. So this trial looked at all adult uh, trauma patients who presented and required an intubation and they just compared DSI to RSI. I'll put the exact protocol here on the screen if you're interested in what they did. Direct laryngoscopy was used in both groups. Both groups were intubated by a second year anesthesia resident. And basically across all outcomes, DSI was clearly better. For their primary outcome, peri-intubation hypoxia, it was significantly lower in DSI. It was 8% versus 25%. First pass success, higher with DSI, 83% versus 69%. Basically all of the outcomes, statistical or not, look better when you use DSI. Now there are a number of different reasons that you can critique this specific trial. I don't think that their outcome was perfect. I don't know why they defined hypoxia as 92% rather than the usual 90%. One minute after intubation might be too soon to look for hypoxia because if there's any shock state at all, you're gonna get a pulse ox lag. And I think their data might demonstrate that because there's actually more hypoxia outliers at two minutes than there were at one minute. I don't think that they necessarily adequately pre-oxygenated. 10 liters a minute is low flow oxygen and we want high flow, flush rate oxygen. And of course, I said it already, this is an unblinded single center trial. But honestly, the most interesting critique of this paper is that they probably used DSI in the wrong patients. DSI was designed for agitated patients. In this trial, they just used it on all comers. But most patients don't need DSI. Most patients have been pre-oxygenated just fine without ketamine. So if anything, in this trial, they included a bunch of patients who didn't seem to need DSI, and that seems like it would bias against DSI. So maybe the numbers look even better if you just focus on the agitated patients. So what are we gonna do with this paper? This puts us in one of the really interesting spots, scientifically speaking because you have to base your practice on the best available evidence. And this is the only RCT, and it suggests a pretty big benefit from DSI in all comers. But if you've ever read anything on first 10 EM before, you know that we have a false positive problem in medical research. We use a ridiculously lax p-value as compared to other areas of science. 
and we consistently underestimate the effect of bias. So time and time again, we see a classic pattern in evidence-based medicine, positive results in small trials just like this one that are completely overturned when we finally get the better designed, higher quality, bigger trials. Now in general, I advised against changing practice based on just one study of this quality. What makes DSI interesting, and the question that Scott raises on MCRIT is, what's the real harm here? Let's imagine you build in a pause, but it can be a pause of any length. So you push your ketamine and you just take five seconds to ask, is everything set up exactly how I want for this intubation? And if it is, you proceed. And in that case, the result is essentially indistinguishable from RSI. But if something's wrong, if the SATs are too low, if the patient's not positioned properly, you fix that problem before pushing the paralytic. And that's DSI. If that's how you're going to implement this, it's hard to see the harm. But my concern about the whole idea of making this just a routine practice is that we can get a little bit loose with that what's the harm argument. It would only take a few bad laryngospasms or a case where you lose the IV right in the middle of that delay period or something else I can't predict right now for the harm to outweigh the potential benefit. And with one unblinded trial, that isn't a proven benefit yet. So I don't think this should be routine. I think we wanna see those bigger, higher quality studies. But I'm really interested in the arguments out there because I gotta tell you, Scott is a very smart dude and every time I argue with him, he seems to win the argument. But whether or not you think this should be routine, I do think that this is a technique that everybody in emergency medicine and critical care needs to know. In emergency medicine, you will definitely encounter patients who are too agitated for a proper pre-oxygenation. And because of that agitation, you can't position them properly. And if you're like most emergency departments that still lay your airway out equipment across the patient's chest, well, your equipment's a mess too. In those patients, you barely even need an RCT. Ketamine to take control of that situation just makes everything safer. Just make sure that you're prepared to take the airway right away if the patient does deteriorate. Again, I think this is a really interesting topic and I'd love to see your thoughts, your arguments, your disagreements in the comments section below. If you found that topic interesting, there is a full write-up, a full published article on this paper on first10em.com, along with a whole bunch of other resuscitation and evidence-based medicine uh, topics. Until next time, take care.